four of the common elements course and <coughs> in today's program presentation we will be dealing with uh, uh, some more topic and some more different kind of prop some more uh, problems related to uh, some more different kind of problems related to uh, the first law of common elements we will also discuss about the specific heaps in the ideal gas law and also discuss about the enthalpy and the uh, nuclear energy of the common elements system and then see the implication in finding the matrix interaction of what inter uh, what uh, what interaction between the first law of common elements so that's in today's agenda so we wait for uh, one more minute to see if others uh, students join first then we can start so that's uh, today's agenda I think we can begin. So, uh, just as a definition, uh, we start by learning what a pure substance is. So, a pure substance is a substance which is uniform in composition and has a uniform chemical aggreg aggregation throughout the process under the consideration. So, a pure substance is for the the example of pure substances can be air because air is a mixture of different types of gases but since their chemical com composition is uniform throughout the <coughs> uh, mixture so we can consider air as a pure substance similar consideration can be given to the like the uh, similar, similar <coughs> consideration can be given to the red skin <coughs> where even if it is a mixture of uh, water and uh, water vapor what is being gaseous is but uh, wet skin since it, it has a uniform composition throughout its uh, throughout its uh, throughout the time of its time of its consideration that's why uh, wet skin can also be considered as a pure substance and that's regarding uh, by, by considering that only we are able to uh, calculate or evaluate all the properties of wet skin and we can draw the PV diagram, PS diagram of the uh, wet skin. Okay, and consider and use them to understand the different types of vapor power vapor power sources. So, sorry. Okay. So this, uh, I guess this statement is very important. That the state of a pure substance is a given mass can be specified in terms of two independent properties. In the absence of in the absence of effect due to gravity motion, we appreciate the angular momentum definition. Okay, so we uh, discussed that uh, <coughs> in the case of uh, single phase uh, system, uh, we needed only two independent properties to completely define the state of the system, right? So similarly, in the case of pure substance as well, the state of a pure substance substance can also be defi defined in terms of two independent properties, usually. But there are some instances, for example, during the case of phase change, only one independent property is enough to define the state of the system. Okay, we will discuss this when we are discussing the vapor uh, cycles and we are doing the Rankine, Rankine cycles and even uh, discussing about the different types of vapor power sources. So we will see that during the case of phase change, the if we specify the temperature, the corresponding corresponding saturation pressure is also specified. And similarly, if we define the pressure. The corresponding saturation temperature for that particular pressure is also defined. So we will see that, okay? Because that was defined. I, I, I guess I discussed about this using the Gibbs phase rule. So F plus Q is equal to Q plus Q, right? Uh, let me again discuss it. So it's written that F plus Q is equal to Q plus K. So F gives gives the degree of freedom of the system. Basically, the number of properties required to define the system completely. K is the number of phases. C is the uh, number of components 
of the in the mixture okay so in the case of a simple phase system uh, we we will have c equal to 1 and uh, see single component system uh, this will be also be equal to 1 then we will get f is equal to 2 right but in the case of phase change we will have c is equal to 2 and c equal to again 1 because component system will be water so we will have f is equal to 2 plus 1 minus 2 that's that's why digital freedom would be equal to 1 in case of uh, wet stream wet stream undergoing phase change Now we discuss about different types of flow substructure. So one, uh, I already gave an ex uh, gave two examples, which is steam or uh, steam, then ideal gas, and uh, or mixture of ideal gases, which is basically air. Okay. While discussing this, uh, let me go and define the ideal gas. What is an ideal gas? So any gas can be treated as an ideal gas if its molecules exert negligible attractive forces as van der Waals forces on each other. Okay, and when are the instances when this would happen? This would happen when the pressure exerted by these gases are extremely negligible, okay, and the temperatures are uh, very high. Okay, these are the two conditions when uh, we can, these are two co conditions when you can say that the ideal go gas law is uh, applicable. Okay, so this ideal gas law would be basically Cv is equal to nRT and with the number represented in, the in terms of number of moles or Cv is equal to MRT represented in terms of mass, we see that it's actually derived from the van der Waals expression of real gas, for real gas, okay. So here you can see, this is the van der Waals expression for real gas, okay. So here you can see if the pressure is zero, if the, the gas, uh, the gas molecules exert any negative attractive forces, then we'll have pressure is equal to zero. Oh sorry, pressure tending to zero, okay. And if pressure tends to zero, it will basically imply the volume of configured by these gas molecules are very large, okay, or in fact, that tends to infinity. Ideally, it would tend to infinity. So in that case, this factor, A m square by V square would be almost equal to zero, okay. And since V is very large, then V is much, much larger than this product of m v, okay. This A and V are uh, constants for this, uh, it's a constant specific to each, each, each gases, okay. So in that case, since this term is also equal to zero and this term is also almost equal to zero compared to V, then we'll have, since these terms will go up, go up, then we'll have Cv is equal to nRT, which is, which is the ideal gas expression, right? So under this assumption, as I mentioned, for P tends to zero, we will have the gas will follow the Boyle's law, which is pressure volume, the Concentration of pressure and the volume is a constant, or pressure inverse, or pressure is inversely proportional to the volume. That if we take V down, then it will be pressure is inverse, inversely proportional to the volume. Or the Charles law, which says that pressure, the volume of gas is directly proportional to its temperature. Then if we combine these two equations, we get the ideal gas equation being C V by T is equal to a constant. Okay. So as I mentioned, uh, the ideal gas law has two different types of points. It is first in terms of number of moles. Second, in terms of the mass of the body. Okay, so he here comes two uh, very crucial constants. Okay, first is the universal gas constant, and second is the specific ga gas constant. Okay, so the universal gas constant has a uh, constant value which is uniform for all the gases, which is equal to 8.3814.5 joule per kilomole Kelvin. Okay. Now, to find the specific gas constant, we just need, we just need to define what we just need to divide the universal gas constant by the molar mass of that gas. Okay, so if you if you want to find the specific gas constant, just divide the universal gas constant by the molar mass of the gas or the particular element. Uh, then you'll uh, then you'll get the specific gas gas constant. Okay, and this this specific gas constant is relevant when we are defining the uh, ideal gas law in terms of its mass, okay? So uh, there are just now so some derivations, which is if we take N uh, in, in the denominator, then we'll have Cv by N is equal to R bar by T, or sorry, uh, sorry by N. So here it is actually R bar by N. Okay, so 
I see students are joining now. So just to let them know that we are going to just briefly of since the content of this week's lecture was not that much, so we'll just briefly go through the topic that we discussed about the unknown in the lecture. Then we'll directly go through the problems for this week's session. Okay, so I guess the session length for this week will be a bit less compared to other weeks, but this week we primarily focusing on solving problems. So we'll just briefly of uh, go through the topic that we discussed about the unknown, just to recapitulate the concept and then directly go to the problem solving part. Okay. So here, so if we take n uh, in the given ratio, then we can write this as p v bar by this is r bar by r bar into p. Okay. So v bar is p by n. Similarly, if we if we case if we consider the ideal case in terms of this mass, then p v is equal to m r t. If we take mass uh, in the denominator in the left hand side, we can write p v is equal to r t, where v is now the specific volume. Okay. Now we know that specific volume is the inverse of density, so we can also write p is equal to rho r t. Okay. So now uh, we just go and see one uh, small derivation. Okay. Consider this case. For an ideal gas, we'll have p v by p is equal to constant. And for an ideal gas only, this is very important. Okay. For an ideal gas only, we will have the internal energy as a function of temperature only. Okay. So u will be only function of temperature. So ideally, u is function of different kind of different types of properties. It may depend on the pressure, volume, and other things. But for an ideal gas, the internal energy depends only on the temperature. Okay. Similarly, we'll see that the enthalpy it is also a function of temperature only in the case of an ideal gas. Okay. Very important. Only for an ideal gas. Now, if you consider a stationary body. Uh, having a rigid, have rigid work, which we specifically imply that it has a constant volume, then if we are applying certain heat to this uh, system, then we can write the first law of thermodynamics for this system as dQ is equal to dV plus delta, uh, delta Q is equal to dV plus delta W. Okay, delta I out because they, these are negative differentials. Similarly, the net work done will be zero because the, since the uh, work of this <coughs> container is rigid, so the PDV work for this system will be zero. So this you can consider PDV work, work to be zero. Now, delta Q, which which will basically imply delta Q is equal to du. Which be, this will basically mean that the net input of heat to this kind of system undergoing a constant volume process, a closed system undergoing a constant volume process, is actually equal to the net change in its internal energy. Okay, this is very important. For a constant uh, volume, uh, for a system, rigid system undergoing uh, a constant volume process, the net heat transfer is actually equal to the net change in the internal energy. Okay, so in that case, now you can represent uh, du as the product of mcv into dt. Okay, that's why now you can see that now u is a function of temperature only. Okay, ideally, that cv is also a function of temperature, but <coughs> for uh, most of the cases, uh, for our consideration, we will treat C V as constant. Usually, uh, if you are going to evaluate, say, the net change in internal energy, we will take the mass and the con uh, specific volume, uh, <coughs> specific heat, cap uh, heat, heat capacity for constant volume. Uh, we will take, take this out of the integral and just evaluate the net change in the temperature. So, but if you are asked in a question, like, without giving any specific, uh, 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 specific information about the process, then you should actually consider C V as a function of temperature again. Okay, C V should be a function of temperature. But for our cases, to simplify our calculations, we'll consider it to be we uh, we mostly consider it to be <coughs> independent of temperature. Okay, but it's not really the case. C V is also actually a function of temperature. We'll see why. Okay, when we go to the derivation, we'll see that C V also turns out to be a function of temperature. Okay, so this kind of similar analysis also done for uh, uh, the. Uh, enthalpy then we in that case we'll see that the <coughs> for a stationary system undergoing a constant pressure process we'll see that the net heat interaction is actually equal to the net change in the enthalpy of the system okay so in that case the enthalpy is also again being introduced so in that case also again the enthalpy is again a function of temperature okay h of t only and again uh, we will see that dh is actually equal to let me write in position letter dH would be equal to mcp mcp into dt so h will also be a function of 
constraints are online. Okay. Yes. Okay. Constraint pressurized pressurized system under the any constant pressure process. Okay. So now let's let's go through some definitions. Uh, we'll see that okay uh, for for simple understanding like uh, we will not go too deep to the origins of this reaction like how the internal energy per degree of freedom for in, uh, for a gas is equal to half kg under this condition. We'll not see how this is derived, but let us just say that uh, it is equal to this. This actually comes from the kinetic theory of gases. So. Once you consider uh, this definition, we'll see how we are able to derive the relation between CP and CV for an ideal gas. And we'll also see how CP, CV, and uh, are actually functions of temperature, even in the case of ideal gases, okay? So where here K is actually the Boltzmann constant given by the, universe, the ratio of universal gas, gas constant and the Avogadro's number, where Avogadro's number is represented by N uh, subscript AB, where which is equal to 6.026 into 10 to the power power 23. It is basically the number of molecules per mole of a substance, okay? Then if the number of degrees of freedom of a translational and vibrational degrees of freedom per molecule is equal to D, say if you represent the number of degrees of freedom as D, then the internal energy per molecule is actually, is actually equal to D into half kp, okay? Where half kp was the number of degrees of freedom uh, <coughs> the internal energy per degree of freedom. Okay, so the total internal energy would be equal to, will be equal to the product of the total degree of freedom times the internal energy per degree of freedom. Okay, so the total total internal energy would be given by d into half kp. Okay, now for one kilomole of gas, the molar internal energy, the molar internal energy is given by q bar is equal to n a b into d into k p by two. Okay, this way we should just take this way. The n a b again uh, again equal to the Avogadro's number. Now, we can again write d, it as d into rt by 2, where actually r, r bar is equal to k into n, n a b, which is derived from this equation, okay? Similarly, the molar enthalpy is given by h is equal to <coughs> h bar is equal to u bar plus t v bar, or u bar is equal to r bar t, where this part is derived from the ideal gas equation, okay? So, h bar can be written as d plus 2 by 2 into r bar into t, okay? Now, this molar internal energy and the molar enthalpy can also be repre uh, represented in terms of the molar specific heat, okay? So, u bar is equal to cv bar into t, which will be equal to d into r bar t by 2, okay? Which is just this equation, okay? We are just equating this into by cv into cv bar into t. So from these two terms, we can write Cv bar is equal to d r bar by 2, okay? Similarly, uh, h bar is equal to Cv Cp bar into t, where Cp bar can be written as, uh, where if we equate this uh, this to this equation, then we'll, we can write Cp bar into t is equal to d plus 2 into r bar t by 2, okay? Then again, Cp is would be equal to d plus 2, into r bar by 2, okay? If you just compare these two equations, then we can write actually this is d plus 2 into r bar by 2, okay? Okay, just uh, forgive me, I'm going through, de through these definitions uh, so that I can uh, derive the relationship between the CP and CV. This was done by Professor Anand Mitchell uh, in the lecture, but just going through it once so that we can uh, apply them very thoroughly in our problems, okay? And just that so it, there's no confusion. Then the specific internal energy and specific enthalpy can be derived as u small u is equal to capital U by the molar mass. Okay, because uh, this cap uh, okay. Actually, I I guess I, I forgot the bar here. Let me just write the bar times k by two. Then u bar was d into R T by two. So we for the specific internal energy, we just divide it by its molar mass, okay? So once you do that, you can you get that small u, which is the specific, in, sorry, specific internal energy is equal to d into rt by 2, where now here r is the specific heat uh, gas constant, okay? Which is equal to cv into t. So here cv would be equal to d into r by 2, okay? 
so that's the di that's the difference between here and there. The uh, here the CD is a specific uh, heat constant for constant volume, <coughs> and here R is the specific gas constant rather than the universal gas constant. Okay, so that's the that's that's the difference. Okay, so it was the here it is more specific heat for constant volume. It's just the now the specific heat for constant volume. Okay, not the molar specific. Molar, molar specific heat for the constant volume. Okay, that's the difference. Okay, o that's the over bar car in units. Okay, the you need to go to derivation to see how it is units. Okay, similarly, small s is equal to capital H bar by m, where m is a molar mass. Similarly, if you go to derivation, you will get that small s is equal to V plus two into R T by two, where R, R again is the specific gas constant. Okay, not the universal gas constant. So small h, the specific enthalpy is equal to Pp into E, where Pp is now the specific uh, heat for a constant pressure process. Okay, not the molar specific heat, only the specific heat. Okay, where so Pp now to be now written as V plus 2 into R by 2. Okay, where V is the number of degree of freedom for a particular gas. Okay, now if we take the ratios of the specific heat, we usually refer to it as gamma. Okay, which is which is also e which is equal to Cp bar by Cv bar, or which again also equal to Cp by Cv. So if we equa equate this with the values of uh, Cv and Cp, if we substitute it here, then we get that gamma is equal to v plus two by v, where v is the number of degrees of degree of freedom. Okay. So <coughs> this is again a very important statement. We we have we have solved one problem regarding this statement. So here we see that for a dieting gas at low temp at low temperatures, when the vibration mode is not excited. Capital D, this number of degrees of freedom is equal to five. Okay. But for monoatomic gas, uh, there are only three translational translational degrees of freedom. Okay. So for monoatomic gas, D is equal to three. But for diatomic gas, we have D is equal to five. Okay. Just a bit subtle uh, statement, but again very important to remember while we are doing some calculations. Okay. In the problems that we are eventually going to solve. So this is the part that I wanted to actually discuss. So now we try to find the relationship between Pp and Cv. Okay, we already do know <coughs> one one relation. <coughs> Can you tell what's the relation one relation between Pp and Cv? Okay, let me just hide the hide the derivation. You can write in the chat box what is one relation between Pp and Cv. We already know. Yes, exactly. Thank you. So we already know that Pp by Cv is equal to gamma. That's one relation we already know. So we'll make use of that while uh, uh, that finding the relationship between Pp and Cv. So, <coughs> now we know that h is equal to small h is equal to small u plus P into V, where V is again the specific volume and U is the specific internal energy. Okay. Now again we can write Pv is equal to RT from the ideal gas law. P into small v is equal to RT. So now, if we substitute Pv is equal to RT, uh, then we can write H is equal to Pp into P, and U is equal to Pv into P, and we keep RT, then we'll get that Pp minus Cv equal to RT. Again, another relation between Pp and Cv. Okay, so another relation is Cp minus Cv equal to R. But again, it's very important, sorry. We are considering this with only for an ideal gas, okay? Why? Because we are uh, applying it. Sorry, we are applying it. We are applying the ideal gas law while uh, while deriving the expression for enthalpy. That's why this relation is only valid for an ideal gas. Okay, but for real gas also, this ratio is this equation is almost this equation is this equation is almost equal to is almost equivalent to this P P and minus P V is almost equal to R, but. For real gases, this becomes exactly equal to R. Okay. Uh, so for ideal gases, this becomes exactly equal to R. Okay. So that's the catch. Now, if we divide this equation by all all this all the terms by Cv, so we'll get Cp by Cv minus one is equal to R by Cv. Then we can write. We know that Cp minus Cp by Cv is equal to gamma. Then we can write Cp by Cv is e this equation as gamma minus one is equal to R by Cv. Okay. So now if we manipulate this equation a bit, then we can find that Cv is actually equal to 
r by gamma minus 1 and sigma is equal to gamma r by gamma minus 1 okay so since this value is known for a particular gas and this value is also known for a particular gas because we know the <coughs> because we, this can be find from this relation b plus two gamma can be find from the can be found from the relation b plus two by b if i'm not wrong or from this relation then we can easily find the value of cp and cp okay similarly cp is gamma r by gamma minus one similarly for the molar specific heat for the molar specific heat we have molar specific heat we can write cv bar is equal to r bar by gamma minus one and cp bar is equal to gamma r bar by gamma minus one okay is it clear till now thank you thank you so much so there's one one example uh, taken by professor anand that is he used uh, he uh, found out the values of r cp and c for nitrogen okay let me just remove nt from here because he didn't specifically mention whether whether it is dynamic or not dynamic or monoid solid so in that case we need to find the value of r cp and cb cv for nitrogen okay so r is again we know that it's a specific gas constant so it will basically be r bar by the molar mass of nitrogen so molar mass of nitrogen is 28 kg per kilo mole so if we evaluate it we get that r is equal to 259.9 joule per kg per mole okay now we need to find gamma because we know that cp and cv both cp and cv are uh, re, uh, are, are <coughs> found out from the values of gamma and r because right because cp is gamma r by gamma minus 1 and cv is r by gamma minus 1 right so we need to find the value of gamma now so gamma is equal is actually equal to b plus 2 by b now for di diatomic nitrogen we have b is equal to 5 then from that we can get gamma is equal to 5 by 2 5 plus 2 by 5 that is equal to 10 by 5 that is equal to 1.4 similarly for a monoatomic nitrogen we have b equal to 3 uh, where gamma will be equal to 3 plus 2 by 3 which is equal to 5 by 2 or 1.67 okay now if we use that they say for you you use it for uh, a di diatomic nitrogen then you get cv is equal to r by gamma minus 1 so if you evaluate it substitute the value of r and gamma then you get cv is equal to 743.2 joule per kg kelvin and cp can again be found by multiplying it, it with gamma or we can apply this relation cp minus cv equal to r once we do that we get that cp is equal to 1039 joule per kg kelvin okay so ha huh, so these are two statement statements i wanted to uh, dis discuss before going to the problem so it is the number of degrees of freedom may change with temperature because of the vibrational mode getting excited at higher temperatures okay but it is basically if the temperature is increased the vibrational mode of the uh, uh, um, gas molecules will get excited the atoms within the gas molecules will also tend to have the vibration mode as another degree of freedom so the number of degrees of freedom would get increased as the temperatures increase right so the degrees of freedom would change now since we know that gamma is equal to b plus sorry let me just write it since we already know that gamma is equal to b plus 2 by b and cp is equal to gamma r by gamma minus 1 and cv is equal to r by gamma minus 1 so we can clearly see that both cp and cv depends on gamma and now gamma itself depends on the degrees of freedom so as temperature increases the fraction of molecules with vibrational excitation will increase and this would result in the degree of freedom b and that's why gamma cp as well as cv vary as a function of temperature okay and that's why i was already mentioning before that cp and cv is ideally are the functions of temperatures but for our analysis for the simplification for our simpli for simplifying the problem that we are going to solve we usually treat cp and cv as constants uh, uh, which is actually usually specified in the question itself but ideally if asked in any kind of interviews or any exams where CP, CP and CV are not specifically defined then actually you should treat it as a, a function of temperature okay so that's very important so I hope
hope it is clear till now. Because now we will directly start solving problems. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. So let me take uh, one example first <coughs> by Professor. That is, that was discussed by Professor Anand himself in the lectures. So <coughs> what you can do, uh, uh, you can help me out to understand the problem. Let's discuss it uh, with each other and try to understand it. So if there's any uh, difficulty in understanding the problem, you can stop me at that point and we can clarify it. Okay. So the first question is, a piston cylinder system contains one kg of air. Okay, so let me point out the key terms here. So it contains one kg of air. The mass of the gas is given. It is expanded to a volume of V is equal to 0 0.2 meter cube per kg. So it is again specific volume. And a temperature of 580 Kelvin to a specific volume of 0 0.8 meter cube per kg. Okay, so the volume is, specific volume is increased. Okay, and a temperature, and, and, and a temperature of 290 Kelvin. So usually in the problems that we dealt till now, we had some kind of relations between pressure and volume. So ni the initial pressure and volume was given and the final, say the final volume was given and pressure was not given and the pressure volume relation was given. Okay, so this is the, something like this. So this was the regular set of problems that we already dealt. So from this relation, we used to find the final volume or the final pressure depending on the unknown that is in the given in the problem. And from that, we could find easily find the net work done, right? But in this question, you can clearly see that the change in the specific volumes are given as well as the temperatures are given. But the change in the pressure is not given at all, right? So we cannot find the pressure explicitly from uh, this uh, to uh, these two given volumes, okay. So we need to find uh, find out different way to find it. Find out different way to find it. Okay. So uh, the clue here is the pressure volume relationship. Okay. So here it is given that P V to the power one point five is equal to zero point seven five for this particular problem. Okay. So now we can see that since P V to the power one point five is equal to zero point seven five, it is ideally a constant. So from this relationship, we can find both P one and P2, because we since we already know V1 and V2, from this relationship we can find easily find the value of P1 and P2, where P is in bar and V is in meter cube per kg. Okay, so the pressure that we get from this relationship will be actually in terms of bar, okay? And we need to determine the net work transfer and heat, and heat interaction in for this particular problem. Here we can see that Cv is given as a constant, right? 0 0.7 uh, kg, kg, kg Kelvin, okay? Kilojoule per kg Kelvin, I'm sorry. So since this problem is already discussed, I don't expect you to solve it now. So you can just go through the problem once and you can just stop me whenever it is difficult to understand. So that similar kind of problems that we, when I ask you to solve in the later part of this previous session, you can try on your own, okay? So the initial step is given as mass is one kg. The initial specific volume is 0 0.2 meter cube per kg and temperature is 580 Kelvin. Similarly, the final step is 0 0.8 meter cube per kg and P2 is 290 Kelvin, okay? So the good thing is since the temperature is explicitly given, so for this kind of problem, now you can easily find the net change the internal energy. So since it is given as air and air can be considered as an ideal gas, so you can easily find the net change in the internal energy because internal energy is a function of temperature in case of ideal gases, right? So we know that the net work interaction can be given by this equation, this integral of P dV, where now V is actually, since we already, in our case, we only know the specific uh, volume, so we try, try, try to, uh, write this equation in terms of specific volume. Okay, so P is equal to V into uh, MV, where M means the mass of the gas and V is the specific volume of the gas. Okay, so from this relation, we get that work done is equal to M into integral of P dV. Okay, so now just substitute the value of P from this relationship. We can write P as 0 0.75 by V to the power 1.5. Okay, so from that we get that work done is equal to 0 0.75 m 
multiply by v to the minus 1 plus i plus 1 and minus 1 minus i plus 1 from 1 to 3. Okay. Now if we evaluate this integral, we get this. Work done from 1 to 3 is actually p1 is equal to minus p2 v2 divided by 1.5 minus 1. Okay, let me represent it as equation number 1. So as we know the pressure volume relationship, we can we know that p1 is equal to the 1.5 to the minus i is again equal to p2 v2 v p2 v2 to the power 1.5. Okay. So we can now find p1, but again remember that p1 is actually in terms of bar. Okay. So any numerical value that we get from this relation is actually is in terms of bar. Okay. So p1 would be equal to 8.38 bar or 838 kilo Pascal. Similarly, uh, p2 would be equal to 0 0.75 by 0 0.8 to the power 1.5, which is equal to 1.04 bar or 104 kilo Pascal. Okay. Why I'm doing kilo Pascal? Because I just wanted to have my net heat and work interactions in terms of kilojoules, so the calculations become much more simpler. Okay. We don't have to deal with large numbers because if it's kept in terms of bar and you are going to represent it in terms of joules, then it will have 8.8 point here in point power 5 this kind of complicated so just to remove that i am representing it in terms of kilopascal okay just divide it uh, multiply it into by 100 you will get the pressure in terms of kilopascal okay so the network interaction will be given by uh, by this equation and uh, work interaction is n into p1 v1 minus p2 v2 divided by 1.5 minus 1 where v and v1 and v2 are the specific volumes okay and mass of the gas in this case of 1 kg <coughs> so work done from 1 to 2 is 838 into 0 0.2 minus 104 into 0 0.8 divided by 0 0.5 1.5 minus 1 right so we get that work done from 1 to 2 is actually 168.8 kilojoules okay so now from first of thermodynamics for this kind of system we have that delta k is equal to du plus delta w okay or delta k is equal to mcv dt plus delta w okay so don't get confused that it is not mentioned that it is a constant volume process. It's not necessary. For an ideal gas, uh, internal energy is only a function of temperature, which can be written as MCV into dT. Okay. Right. So don't get confused with that. That we are using CV when it is not a constant volume process. It's nothing like that. For an ideal gas, only for an ideal gas, you can write the internal energy change in internal energy as MCV into dT. Okay. Only for an ideal gas. Or we can write du as mcv dt for a real gas when if it is a constant volume process. Okay. So these are the key uh, terms that you need to recall so that you don't get confused by the substitutions. Okay. So from that, since we were already given the initial and the final temperatures, we can easily evaluate the net uh, change in internal energy. So from that, we get that uh, Q122 is 1 into 0 0.71L. This was given. This was already given. This was in terms of kilojoule per kg Kelvin. Then final temperature was 290 and the initial temperature was 580. So we substitute that. And plus 168.8, this is the net work interaction. Okay. So once this is the calculation, we get that Q122 is minus 48.12 kilojoules okay so i hope it is clear this example was discussed by professor anand so i'm just re revising it because we know we need to, we need to understand the steps so that you can solve the next set of problems that i ask you to try okay try out so thank you thank you so much so again let us discuss this problem is as well this is an interesting problem because here we get introduced by the concept of latent heat that's why i thought that it, it would be good to discuss this problem as well okay so it is desired to melt aluminum <coughs> from a solid block of 15 degrees celsius so the initial temperature of the block of aluminum is 15 degrees celsius okay so specific let me just underline it so it's a more proper the specific heats of solid and liquid aluminum are 0 0.9 kilojoule per kg Kelvin and 1.11 kilojoule per kg Kelvin respectively. Okay, for sol solid and liquid aluminum, the specific heats are different. Okay, then they are explicitly mentioned here, and the latent heat is 390 kilojoules per kg. kg okay, the density of the molten state is 2400 kg per meter cube, and the final temperature is 70 de 700 degrees Celsius. Okay, <coughs> so once you heat them, <coughs> I'm sorry. 
<coughs> so once you are trying to melt the aluminium, so you need to keep the, the block of aluminium in the furnace, furnace and the temperature of this block of aluminium will rise to a certain uh, temperature that would be usually greater than the uh, melting point of the aluminium, right? So why? Because we will see. Because if we do not do, do it, we cannot uh, achieve the molten form of aluminium. Okay. So and the melting point of aluminium is 360 degree Celsius. Okay. Now determine the mass of aluminium that can be melted per hour if the power rating of the furnace is 217 megawatt and its efficiency is 70 percent. Okay. So these are all the inf uh, necessary uh, information that we need to to solve the problem. Okay. So the first and the most important concept that we want to discuss here here is the concept of latent heat. Okay. So can anyone of you please tell me what do you mean by latent heat or where it is applicable? You can just write it as a one line statement. I don't know, don't want the the perfect definition, just what latent heat actually is and where it is used for. So the thing is, <coughs> when uh, we are discussing phase change, okay, say phase change of water from liquid to gas, uh, then we will see that it, it is speci it will be extremely clear when we are discussing the uh, vapor vapor cycles or we are discussing the uh, steam cycles, right? So there will we will see that during phase change, even if the system is absorbing heat, the temperature of the system remains constant, okay? So usually we see that, okay, okay, thank you, thank you, I, I extremely, I'm extremely thankful that you, you uh, got gave the perfect definition. So it's exactly correct. So what, what uh, I'm just trying to give you something that be, would be, that will become relevant to this problem as well, okay? It's not wrong, but I'm just trying to put it in my way as well so that I can, let me you understand the concept and help you to understand the problem, okay? So we see that, uh, we, we saw that from the first law of thermodynamics, say delta Q is equal to du plus delta W, okay? So let's just consider that the network inter interaction is zero because the system is stationary or it is not doing any kind of expansion or compression. Then the PDV work is actually equal to zero. And also ignore the kinetic and potenti potential energy. Because in such this kind of problem, where we are melting aluminum, so there is no case of any kinetic or potential energy. And of course, there is no PDV work. Okay. The boundaries of the system are not moving, right? So there is no PDV work involved. So the, the net heat input to the system would be actu actually equal to the net change in the internal energy. And we saw that this internal energy is actually a function of temperature. Okay, in, in the case of an uh, ideal gas, okay, we saw that. But in the case of, again, we, are, we, we also saw that in the case of uh, a constant volume process, which is again exactly what we are dealing with right now, uh, this, uh, this internal energy can be explicitly written as MCE into dt, right, because the volume of the system remains constant and the, uh, the boundaries of the system are not moving. So the volume will remain, volume of the system would remain constant, okay? So we can write again this as the change in internal energy, internal energy as MCV into dt, okay? If you equate it, so Q1, Q2, this will be MCV Q2 minus Q1, okay? Just consider it. So now you clearly see that if we apply heat, the temperature of the system would increase, right? But in the case of latent heat or the hidden heat as a uh, the literal meaning of this word, what happens is that when there's a phase change, okay, say if the water is now changing from liquid to vapor, what happens is that this <coughs> phase change, the change of phase from the liquid to vapor also requires some certain energy, okay, which will not 
show up as an increase in the increase in the temp, increase in the temperature of the uh, system but rather this energy would be actually absorbed by the system for this phase change to occur okay so if you are going to change the aluminum from solid to liquid then what happens is that still there is a phase change occurring now because up till before the phase change if you any kind of heat given to the system would show up as an increase in the internal energy okay but when there is phase change this phase change would inherently require some external energy additional energy that would not show as any change in the temperature but which would actually show that the temperature would remain constant throughout this phase change process say if it, it takes certain time then this phase change throughout this time the temperature of the system would remain constant but the system would continue to take on heat which is actually utilized for this phase change to occur okay and then once this phase change has occurred so say the now the aluminum is converted from solid to liquid now if you are applying further heat this liquid will again the temperature of this liquid phase of aluminum will again increase okay but during this phase change there is no change in the temperature of the system this heat is entirely used for the phase change process rather than the increase in the internal energy okay so is this part clear it's very important very subtle point but it's important okay for this kind of projects because once you look in the solution is simple addition of this given value but why you are adding it you need to know why there is no consideration for a change in temperature during this phase change you need to know that because there is no change in temperature during the phase change right where is the heat going the heat is now being absorbed as a latent heat required to change the phase from solid to liquid so is this part clear or um, should i repeat it understood thank you okay so that's what i wanted to uh, let you know so if you know it now so it's completely fine so here you can clearly see that even if the melting point of aluminum is 660 degrees celsius the furnace operator is in, is heating it to a temperature higher than the melting point to ensure so that it, he, he or she can ensure that the the latent heat of the required to change the aluminum from solid to liquid is uh, given to the solid aluminum so that the phase change can occur and we can obtain the liquid aluminum okay so that's why the final temperature is higher than the melting point of aluminum so now if you look into it we have that q bar is 270 megawatt that is the power rating of the furnace and time of operation is 1 hour or 3600 seconds okay so net heat applied would be q q uh, q dot into p i said this is q bar i'm sorry it's actually q dot so net heat transfer to the system or of aluminum would be uh, q dot into p so this is equal to 270 into 10 to the power 6 that is megawatt right into 3600 this is the time so we get that uh, now if you want to have a q actual because the efficiency of the furnace is 70 percent so the net heat that will be uh, that will be exact that will be actually transferred to the aluminum would be 0 0.7 times the net heat generated by the furnace okay so the q actual now would be equal to so now this heat should be actually be equal to m into cv S, where CVS is the specific heat for the solid aluminum into delta T, the temperature change during the solid, alum, uh, the solid aluminum phase, plus M into HLS, where this HLS is the latent heat, okay, times the mass of the aluminum, okay, plus M into CVL into delta T, where CVL is the specific heat for the liquid aluminum, liquid phase aluminum, okay, and delta T is the net change in temperature during that uh, process during the ti time when the aluminum is in the liquid phase okay so we need to find the mass of aluminum that can be melted right so now m if we take m common from all these terms we can write m is equal to 0 0.7 q right because q actually is equal to 0 0.7 q m is equal to 0 0.7 q divided by cvs into delta t plus hls plus cvl into delta t if we now write it as 0 0.7 into 217 into 10 to power 3 into 3600 now you can argue why i have changed from 6 to 3 because since all these terms are in terms of uh, 0 0.9 is actually in terms of 
philosophical discipline, right? So we need to have the numerator as also in terms of philodus, right? So just to represent it in terms of philodus, let me just remove the confusion. Okay, let me write it in terms of here also as philodus. This is in philodus. Okay, whatever the linear numerator will be, we can calculate it at the last, right? So that there's no confusion. Okay, so m is equal to 0 0.2 into 217 into 10 to power 3 into 1600 divided by 0 0.9 into the temperature change in the solid phase because the initial temperature of the aluminum was 15 degrees Celsius. The, the temperature change in the solid would be from the initial temperature to the melting point of the aluminum, which is 350 degrees Celsius. Okay. Plus the latent heat, that is again 390 kilojoule per kg. Right. This is, let me go there. This is given here, right? So 390 kilojoule per kg. So you can write here 390 itself. Plus 1.1 into 700 minus 650. Why? Because, uh, as I ma already mentioned, during the phase change, the temperature remains constant. So the liquid temperature would have an initial temperature of 63 degrees Celsius, and it will heat up to 700 degrees Celsius. That is the final temperature up to which the furnace was heated, right? Or the, uh, sorry, the, the aluminum was heated in the furnace. Okay, so that's why this temperature value. Okay, it's actually a very simple calculation, but you need to know where which value to put where. Okay. So finally, when once you do that, do that calculation, you get that M is actually equal to 787 into 10 to the power 3 kg per hour. So you can actually melt 787,000 kg of aluminum per hour with this power ratio. So I hope it is clear. Or you have any doubt in the problem? Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So I guess now we can uh, start solving the problems. So let me just show you the problems for this week. Okay. So I hope the questions are visible. Okay. <coughs> so let us discuss the first problem. Okay. The first two questions are the true and false type questions so of, of course uh, <laughs> there are only two options and one of them is correct 50 50 percent chance but still let us hope that we get the right one all the time okay so statement one is work may be done by a closed adiabatic system without a decrease in its internal energy okay so work may be done by a closed adiabatic system closed adiabatic system without a decrease in its internal energy so is it true or false you can write in chat box Why? Yes, exactly. <coughs> so it's actually correct. So the answer is false. Why? Because just now apply the first law of thermodynamics. Because okay. So we have delta Q is equal to du plus delta W. Just ignore the kinetic and the potential energy because it is explicitly mentioned that the kinetic and the potential energies are zero. Okay. And usually we'll see that for most of the thermodynamic system that we discuss, specifically in the case of uh, the from the perspective of mechanical engineering. So I'm not explicitly mentioning it, but say if you are reading this course as a mechanical engineering student, so most of the times when you are discussing uh, the first law of thermodynamics, the net changes in the kinetic and the potential energies are usually zero, but we also dealt with some problems which specifically had kinetic energy and specifically specifically had potential energy as the total energy of the system, but, but usually now you'll see, eventually see that the more we dive deep into the course, the net internal energy, net change in the energy is actually the internal energy of the system, okay, and mostly the kinetic and the potential energies are neglected, okay, but it's not always necessary to be true, okay? I'm just saying most of the time, most of the problems will be such like, right? But it's not always true. So now they are saying it's an adiabatic system. So the net change in the heat, net heat interaction is zero. So we'll basically have, uh, the net change in the internal energy is actually the net work done on the system, net work done by the system, okay? So we'll have du is equal to minus delta w, right? So so any work done would have its effect on the internal energy, okay? So if work is done now on the system, 
So internal energy would increase. If you done by the system, the internal energy would, would go down. Okay. Just look at the minus sign. Why is this happening? Okay. So work done on the system would mean that work done is negative. By the sign convention, negative energy would add up. It will become positive. So net, it, the DU would become positive. So net internal energy would increase. Similarly, if work done by the system, the work done would be positive by such sign convention, as I mentioned earlier. So it will be minus the net work done minus the magnitude of the work done. So it will mention that DU is negative. So net internal energy would go down. Okay. So it's simple energy balance. <coughs> now, statement two is work is a path independent function. Work is path independent between two specified states for an adiabatic system. So is it true or false? It's actually a, what to say, continuation of the first. Yes, it is. Actually, you are correct, but uh, you need to see the question as well. Work is path independent between two specified states for an adiabatic system. For an adiabatic system. So adiabatic system del Q is zero. So net work interaction becomes the by is equal to the net change in internal energy. Now is the ch is the change in internal energy a path independent function or not? Since, if you look into it, since you are able to represent work as the change in internal energy, so what can you tell about the work interaction? Does it become path independent? Only in the case of an adiabatic system. It's, it's also very important. possible okay interesting actually can you explain me uh, your uh, how you are saying both are possible it's actually interesting also I also don't know but can you t tell me I wanted to I want to know actually about it because from my, from my perspective I find it to be true because since Work interaction is now is only is on is actually equal to net change in internal energy and internal energy is a path independent function. So that I can tell that since work interaction is equal to the net change in internal energy and internal energy itself is a path independent function, so work interaction in the case of a path independent in the case of an adiabatic system is a path independent function. So that's a very basic level of understanding that I'm applying from my side, but. Since you are saying both are possible, can you please let me know uh, how? But I wanted to know. It's actually, it's very interesting. Okay, okay, fine. Okay, actually, see, no need to feel shy. Okay, it's a very elaborate subject. Uh, if you have different understanding and perspectives, you are most welcome to share. And I'll be very happy if I get to learn from you as well. Okay. So thank you. Like, I also look into it if there are some special cases when this is not true. Uh, let's see. But from my understanding, I thought it to be in that way and seem that this is the correct answer, but of course, other ideas and pers uh, uh, perspectives are also invited, okay, uh, encouraged. Okay, so let us go to the next question. Again, it's a simple question, but again, needs a <coughs> basic uh, knowledge that we dealt, uh, that we discussed in the previous week, okay. An engine working in a cycle very crucial term, working in a cycle, specific thermodynamic cycle in this case, undergoes two work interactions and three heat interactions. So the work interaction one is five kilojoule of work is done on the engine. <coughs> work interaction two is 55 kilojoule of work is done by, this by the engine. Heat interaction one is 155 kilojoule of heat is transferred to the engine and Heat interaction 2 is 55 kilojoule of heat is given out of the engine. So now what is the value of the third heat interaction given in this thermodynamic cycle? 
it should be in kilojoule. Okay. So try to think about it for a bit. What happens in the case of a common Banach cycle? Uh, how we can find the third heat interaction? Okay. <coughs> Let me give you say two minutes. Very simple question, but again needs understanding of the con basic concepts of the first law for thermodynamic cycle. You can look into it once and then tell me in about two minutes. You can try it. Minus 50 heat or CO2. Sorry for the delay, you know. And actually, this is correct. So I guess we applied the uh, this relation to for thermodynamic cycle, net heat interaction into the net work interaction. So just add up the net heat and work interactions by the proper sign conventions. Okay, then just do it. You know. So net work interaction work first. First is the work done on the system, so it takes minus psi. Then 65 kilojoule work is done by the by the engine, so it is plus 65. Then again, minus uh, 155 kilojoule heat is transferred to the engine, so it is again 155. Then 65 kilojoule of heat is given out by the engine, so it is minus 65. Okay. So once you do that, a plus some Q that is unknown. Okay. So it would be again 60 is equal to 100 plus Q, so you get that Q is equal to minus 50 kilojoule. So now it is trying to rest that the heat goes out of the engine. Okay. Very simple. The key term was working in a cycle. Okay. So the next question <coughs> is uh, given by it's, it's given here. It says an electric generator coupled to a windmill produces an average electric power of 5 kilowatt. Okay. The power used to charge a storage and the power is used to charge a storage battery. to charge a storage battery. Okay. The heat transfer from the battery to the surrounding is 0 0.6 kilowatt to the surrounding. Determine the total amount of energy stored in the battery in 8 hour operations. Okay. So you can see that this heat interactions and work interactions are given in terms of watt. So and the time of operation is also given. So to find the net heat interaction and work interaction you need to find the uh, find it in terms of kilojoules or joules. So you can do it by multiplying it the by the multiplying the power with the time of operation. Okay, so you do that conversion and then uh, tell me the net internal energy which is stored in the battery during this time of operation. Okay, again very simple application of first law of thermodynamics, but the tricky part here is the application of the sign convention and the what is the system that you are going to choose. Okay, would it be the generator? or the windmill or the battery. Okay. Let me give you say three or four minutes. You can try out. And then tell me now. Okay. 
kilowatt, you can keep the work interaction in terms of kilowatt hour. Okay. Means when converting it to joules, again, it's difficult because you need to convert the joule hour into seconds. So. Uh, <coughs> Actually, you do not need, yeah, it's actually, that's correct, but you do not need the current here because they already gave the net power, right? net power is 5 kilowatts. So if the current and the voltage was given, or uh, then you can, you could have multiplied it to get the power, but the power is directly given, right, 5 kilowatts. So, so to find the net heat inter uh, work interaction is just power into time, so 5 kilowatt into root. Okay, 126720 kilojoules okay so here i don't know the answer but i will look into it okay so it may be correct okay fine let, let us let, let me wait for one, one more student uh, we i gave four minutes uh, three four minutes so let me wait till 7 12 okay so that that can also You see that most of the problems that we are dealing till now, the basic ones, actually the, actually the small ones, are usually uh, based on hitting pro the proper sign convention. Not only here, the, the, the useless, uh, the problem discovery problem that Anand also, he emphasizes on putting the right sign conventions as well, right? The formula for work interaction, that's fine, but the sign conventions are also, sign conventions are also very important. Here in this problem, I guess the sign convention is the most crucial part. So, and it depends on what kind of system, what, the, what is the system that you're going to use. Okay. One more minute, it will be 7.12, then we can check the answer. Okay, 7.12. So thank you for the answers. Let, let us just go through the solution once. Yes, I also forgot the numerical value of this answer. And then see whether it matches with what we discussed. I kept it in the last. Okay, so this is the part. So we have that work done was. So we, uh, for this, we choose the battery as our system. Okay, and since work is done on the system or on the battery while it is charging, so the wor net work interaction will be negative. Okay, so I hope uh, you did the same, right? So the net work interaction will be negative for the battery because work is done. On the on the battery, right? While it is charging, so it is it will be minus forty kilowatt hour. Okay, five kilowatt into eight hours. It is forty kilowatt hour. It is negative because work is done on the battery while it is charging. Similarly, it gives up or dissipates heat to the surrounding. So again, the heat going out of the battery will be negative. So it is minus zero point six into eight or minus four point eight kilowatt hour. Okay, for the first law of thermodynamics, applying on the battery as our system, we'll have delta U is equal to Q minus W. So Q is minus 4.8 minus minus 40, so we'll get delta U as 35.2 kilowatt hour, or delta U is equal to 1.27 into 10 to the power 5. Okay, let me just compare the answer that is given by one of the student. So yeah, exactly. So it's correct. Actually, it's more precise than mine. So that's correct. So extremely thank you uh, for the answer. And others also, I guess you tried it exactly the same way. So I hope this is clear. The answer is clear. Is it? Fine, then we can proceed to the next question. Do you understand that why I took, well, okay, fine, the work interaction is negative because I chose the battery as our system because if I would have chosen generator as our system, then it would be a positive work interaction because the generator is working on the battery so it is a positive work interaction for the generator. But we do not know any kind of heat, inter uh, heat interaction for the generator which is not, which is not explicitly given. We are always, always, we have given the heat interaction, the work interaction as well as the energy interaction, sorry, as well as the heat and work interaction for the battery, right? We are explicitly given the heat and work interaction of the battery. So from that we can find the net energy interaction for the battery, right? So it is wise to choose the battery as our system. And that's why I have chosen work done as minus 40 kilowatt hour for the bat uh, battery because the work is done on the, s on the battery while it is charging, okay? So let's go to the next question. Yeah, five, okay. <coughs>
gas of 4 kg is contained within the piston cylinder machine. The gas undergoes a process for which PV to the power 1.5 is constant. The initial pressure is 3 bar and the initial volume is 0.1 meter cube. Okay. And the final volume is 0.2 meter cube. The internal energy of the gas decreases by 4.6 kg kilojoule per kg. There are no significant changes in Ke and P, kinetic energy of working energy. Determine the net heat transfer in the process. So, uh, uh, still it's again a very simple question. Something uh, I already told that this is the usual pattern of the questions while we are studying the work interactions in the first class. That is the initial pressure and the <coughs> initial and the final initial pressure and initial volume as well as the final volume is given. So the unknown is the initial pressure. So from this relation, we can find the initial pressure, and we know that for any polytropic process, because here it's polytropic, so the value of n is not one or one point four. So no specific values of n or say 0 or infinity so this is a value other than 0 infinity 1 n 1.4 so this is a polytropic process so for any polytrop polytropic process work done is given by p1 v1 minus p2 v2 divided by n minus 1 okay so once you know that <coughs> more about the heat interaction also uh, the internal energy is also given so the only unknown is the heat interaction so first you find p2 then find the work interaction, then use the first law of thermodynamics to find the net heat transfer. Okay. So let me give you say four minutes for this question. Simple calculation. I also told it told told this step. And moreover, see, this is the cap, so it is four kg of gas. Okay. So you need to multiply it accordingly to find the net heat transfer. Because the net internal energy change is given in terms of kilojoule per kg. So you need to multiply it by 4 to find a net change in internal energy. Net heat transfer, the work transfer is 72.4. Okay, okay, that's fine. Thank you. <laughs> so, so just to find the net heat transfer as well. Transfer was So, <coughs> what is the final pressure that we are getting? So, you just write that as well. P2, what are given P2? Okay. Okay. 
చాప్టర్ నైన్ ఫిఫ్టీన్ శివ కుమార్ ఇంక్రీజ్ బై ద వాల్యూ ఆఫ్ పీపీ ఆర్ జెడ్ జస్ట్ టు వెరిఫై బికాస్ ఓకే సెవెంటీన్ పాయింట్ సిక్స్ నా ఇట్స్ కరెక్ట్ ఓకే ఓకే సో ఐ గెస్ వీ హెవ్ అండర్స్టూడ్ ద మిస్టేక్ ఎస్ ఎస్ వన్ పాయింట్ జీరో సిక్స్ ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ ఎగ్జాక్ట్లీ ఎస్ కరెక్ట్ సో అండ్ నేను ఐ గెస్ ద ఓన్లీ మిస్టేక్ దట్ ఇట్ సీమ్స్ ఫ్రమ్ యువర్ పార్ట్ ఈస్ నాట్ మల్టీప్లైయింగ్ ఫోర్ ద మాస్ ఆఫ్ ద గ్యాస్ విత్ ద స్పెసిఫిక్ ఇంటర్నల్ ఎనర్జీ సో ఐ గెస్ యూ టు దట్ టు గెట్ ద ఎగ్జాక్ట్ ఆన్సర్ yes yes work done is 17.572 but the here the net heat intention is us so it seems that in your part uh, yep uh, you didn't multiply the mass of the gas with the specific internal energy uh, specific internal energy and to do that you get the net heat intention as well just do that and work interaction is fine exactly correct plus 17.6 17.576 it's exactly correct so are you trying out now let me go to the solution till now it's correct just need to find the net heat interaction yes yes exactly correct thank you so kumar for this thing and i guess everybody else will also do the ex- exact the exact same get the exact same an- same answer so but for sake of saving time just go to the solution as well because till now it's exactly yes yes just with the minus sign i guess <laughs> yes okay so uh <coughs> thank you is exactly correct so if i go back here uh, yes so the work interaction as i mentioned is given by p1 d1 minus p2 d2 divided by an n minus 1 for any polytropic process right <coughs> except except for when n equal to 1 you get different transition energy sources so there's a slight different kind of derivation so you need to do <coughs> then this <coughs> formula is not applicable okay <coughs> so uh, we know that p1 d1 to the 1.5 divided by p2 into the 1.5 because uh, pv to the power 1.5 is a constant so p2 is p1 by d1 by d2 to the power 1.5 so p2 is a 3 into d1 by 1 by d2 to the power 1.5 plus p2 is 1.0 to the power okay now work done need to be given by this equation just substitute the value of p1 and d1 and p2 and d2 to get that work done So 1 to 2 is 17.6 kJ, okay? So it's multiplied by 10 to the power 3. Just cases are in bar, volumes are in meter cube. Just multiply by 10 to the power 3 to get the answer in terms of kJ, okay? So it's into 100, maximum kJ is 100 to get into an answer in terms of kJ, okay? Now, Q1 to 2, the, uh, the net heat interaction will be given by the net change in internal energy plus the net work interaction. net change in internal energy will be m into u2 minus p1 plus work done from 1 to 2 where u2 minus p1 was minus 4.6 why because they told that the internal energy decreases right so it is 4 into minus 4 into 4.6 plus 17.6 which gives us q the, the net inter- heat interaction from 1 to 2 as minus 0.8 kJ okay so i hope it is clear uh, let us go to the next question Question number six is quite interesting, not that difficult, but interesting question nevertheless. So the rate of heat transfer between a certain electric motor and its surrounding varies with time as Q dot is equal to minus 0.2 times 1 minus e to the power 0.65 T, where T is in second and Q dot is in kilowatts. The shaft of the motor rotates at a constant speed of 100 radians per second. and apply a constant torque of 18 newton meter ok 
okay and the key thing to remember is the is a uh, constant speed of 80 meters per second so this is actually equal to omega okay this is not rpm or rounds per minute this is actually radian per second so there this is there is giving the angular velocity which, which is basically the <coughs> angular displacement per unit time okay so this is directly equal to omega okay so the shaft motor rotates at a constant speed of omega is equal to 100 radians per second and applies a constant torque of 80 newton meter okay so an external load okay so an external load the motor draws a constant electric power of 2 kilowatt then obtain an expression for a time rate of change of energy of the motor okay again very simple again we need to find the uh, we need to apply the first law of thermodynamics to find the relationship between q internal energy and the work interaction then we need to we need to obtain an expression for time rate of change of the internal energy of the motor okay q is the first law of thermodynamics Equal to Q dot is equal to V by dt plus W by dt. Okay. Try it out once. Let me give you say up to seven thirty. So you can take four minutes to solve the question, and then I'll send you the answer. Don't get confused with the <laughs> expression for the net heat interaction, it's just to confuse you. It's actually not that important, but just a uh, diagram to let you uh, 
week while uh, applying the first law tournament. So you'll see that once you apply the first law tournament week, certain terms get cancelled out and you get a very simple expression which is only a function of time, which actually tells you how the uh, internal energy of the motor decreases or varies. Okay. So <coughs> I guess Okay, let me give you two more minutes. It's fine. So it's not difficult, just slightly different type of question. Okay. Meanwhile, I, like like the previous questions, you can just tell me if some other like if you found found other network interaction also, you can tell me so that I can know whether you are going in the right direction or not. Okay. So yeah, here I am mentioning again and again that this is hundred radians per second, not to be confused with the RPM or RPS, okay, it's directly the angular velocity omega, because see it is in terms of the angular displacement, it is in radians per unit time, so it is actually omega. So the net work done, the net shaft work will be actually equal to omega into T, okay. So T is the torque. So uh, again, there is a concept. Again, we have to apply the concept of time conventions as well. Okay, minus zero point two. Uh, okay. So mm, yeah, correct. Correct. Work done is minus zero point two kilowatt. Yeah. Yeah. Correct. I hope that I, I, it seems that you have applied the sign convention perfectly. So again, it's just a simple uh, subtraction from Q, right? Q is minus 0 0.2 into 10 to into 1 into power minus 0 0.65 T. So just subtract it from the net heat interaction, you'll get the net uh, rate of change of the internal energy of the motor. Now can you tell me the answer after that? You can write the exponential part as small e, I don't understand that because it will not change, but yes, you can just write the exponential part as small e or exp to the power minus 0 0.65 t, something like that, it's fine. Okay, so thank you, it seems that uh, all of you are in the right direction, so let me sh uh, show you the answer as well, okay. So here. I guess yeah. yes, yes, exactly, exactly. That's fine. Exactly, that's the correct answer. Okay. So uh, thanks, Anil, for the answer. Okay. So here you can see that the net rate change of in uh, energy of the system is given by d by d two is equal to q dot minus w dot, where q dot is already given this this expression. Okay. So we are not writing it again and again. Just writing it as q dot for now. Minus w dot shaft plus w electric. Okay, so you can see that the shaft work is actually the work done by the motor. Okay, if we choose the motor as our uh, system, because we are asked to find the net rate of change of energy of the motor, which is our system in this case, then the work is done by the motor, so this would be a positive force. Okay, that would be W dot shaft as T into W, where T is the net torque. Will be this will be equal to 18 into 100 into, into minus 3 if you have if you want to write in the it, it in terms of kilowatt so we get w dot shaft as 1.8 kilowatts okay similarly the w dot electrical is minus 2.0 kilowatt why because it the motor draws a electric power of 2 kilowatt from the uh, electric source or electric power input so it is negative okay and moreover just to make your understanding 
far uh, more better right here since you can clearly see that the salto has to be less than the net electric input right because no system is 100 percent efficient so the net work done by the system would actually be actually so the net work in output by the system must actually be lesser than the net work input on the system and because there there is no uh, other sources of in work input or only work input is elect wor electrical work input so the net work output should be uh, ideally lesser than the net work input so we, there's also there's also some uh, by another means by which we can verify your answers so once you know that we can substitute these values in this equation so you get that d by dt is equal to 0 0.2 into 1 minus dt by 0 0.6 times t plus 1.8 minus 2 so from here you get that the net work interaction as minus 0 0.2 so once you do the subtraction once you do this uh, addition you get that uh, the net heat okay the net uh, energy transfer is minus 0 point oh i think i have done mistake uh, here also so it should be minus sign right minus sign This would be again. Uh, oh, here it is minus sign, right? So this would become plus, right? So because here it is minus minus. Let me just write it, okay? So it will be clear. Sorry for the mistake from my side. So it would be minus zero point two plus zero point two. Zero point two e to the power minus zero point six five t minus minus so minus minus zero point two so it will be minus zero point two plus zero point two plus zero point two e to the power minus zero point six five t so this comes to god so you get zero point two e to the power minus sorry minus zero point six five t so the net Decrease in the internal energy or net variation of the internal energy of the motor is actually given by 0 0.2 e to the minus 0 0.65 t. So it, it tells us that the net internal energy of the motor actually decreases exponentially with time. Okay. So I hope that it was everything was clear. So, yeah. so now let us go to the next question. number seven so it's again a very simple question a gas expands from an initial state where the pressure is 340 kilopascal and the volume is 0 0.0425 liter cube to a final pressure of 120 kilopascal okay the relationship between the pressure and the volume of the gas is cv square is equal to a constant determine the work done in the process again very simple process very simple question you need to find the final volume using this relationship then just find the network interaction by this equation q in this case by q is the percutive index so it should be q minus 1 followed by the index okay it's very simple i think only 3 minutes are enough P1, V1 square is equal to P2, V2 square. Just check the unit. It is liter cube, so no need to worry about any uh, addition, uh, multiplication by mass. So V2 would be equal to P1 by P2 to the power 1 by 2 into V1. Right? P1 and P2 you know. V1 also you know. From that you can find out uh, V2. So once you find V2, so just, just substitute it in this equation to find the network interaction.
simple calculations uh, we two of them then are you mentioned given by v1 is equal to 1 by q2 and q bar of half so this is 0.045 and q41 is equal to 3 by 1 by 2 so you get v3 is 5 and 0 0.067 times v3 and work done for 1 2 is q1 by 1 is 1 q2 which is again 1 by 10 minus 1 so work done means here the total is 0 0.045 minus 150 into 0 0.067 so you get 18 minus 1 so you get more than it 5 minus 2 by 2 so this is the value 5 as <coughs> uh, uh, Shiva Kumar already mentioned right so that's it so let us go to next question so this question will be a bit more tricky and uh, interesting as well so yeah thank you so this question is uh, something interesting so somewhat interesting so uh, let us go to the question okay a cylinder is divided into two compartments a and b by a frictionless thermally insulated piston that is free to move okay this piston is thermally insulated okay so it and it is free to move okay so this is the resistance provided to this piston so it is free to move and the cylinder is well insulated except at the right end so you can see that these dash lines are actually the representation of insulation in the case of thermodynamics so this cylinder is actually well insulated in all its side except at this end where there is a heat input to the compartment b okay initially compartment a contains 0 0.2 kg of air at 150 kilopascal okay so i think i just underline the key aspect free to move well insulated except at the right end initially the comp initially compartment a contains 0 0.2 kg of air at 150 kilopascal and 40 degree celsius and compartment b contains 1 kg of air at same temperature and pressure okay so again initially pd would be 150 kilopascal and td would be 40 degree celsius heat is slowly transferred to b until the final pressure of 300 kilopascal so heat is transferred at b slowly up, up till the pressure at this compartment is 300 kilopascal okay both at a and b the pressure is 300 kilopascal assume air to be a pure substance governed by this relation pv is equal to 2.8860 or 2.8 288.68 8 p with cv is equal to 733 kilo joule, uh, joule per kg kelvin okay where pressure is in pascal g is in meter cube per kg and p is in kelvin an adiabatic process for air can be assumed to follow pv to the power 1.393 is a constant okay then the final temperature of a is in kelvin given by okay so the key thing to know is that that <coughs> this even if heat is applied to the compartment b which would result in the movement of the piston because of the heat application heat, uh, applied, uh, application of heat to the compartment b so this piston will tend to move 
towards the component A okay because of the expansion now <coughs> even if heat is not directly applied to uh, compartment A compartment A is being affected because of the heat application to comp compartment B okay and this uh, I'm sorry uh, this uh, interaction between A and B has resulted in the compression of air in the compartment B okay which in turn resulted in the increase in pressure from 1s to 3 to 300 kilo Pascal and this interaction between B and A is actually adiabatic okay that is that is the key thing to know for this particular question so even if it is applied at B and there is no heat application at compartment A then also the pressure volume or the net the net thermodynamic system that occurs for the compartment A is adiabatic okay this compartment A is indirectly affected because of the heat applied at compartment B but then also the process the thermodynamic process for the compartment A can be considered to be adiabatic okay so that's the key that I want key term that I wanted to mention now you can go ahead and try to solve the problem it's a bit tricky so I am thinking that maybe we can keep it as the last problem for today's session you can take enough time say I can let me wait up to 754 for you to try out you can mention me the doubts or any GA1 is 0 0.124 meter cube okay so yeah actually I don't have the let me just check it at this time okay VB is 0 0.60. Okay. Okay. It can be explicitly found out from this relationship. So I guess that is correct. Okay. I, I'm not looking at the numerical values, but the key is that you can find out the volume for A and B compartment using this relationship. Okay. This one. Again, remember that the volume that you will get here is in meter cube per kg. To get the total volume, you need to multiply it with uh, the respective masses of gas in the compartment A and B. Then you can get the total volume of compartment A and compartment B. Okay, so I feel it seems correct, but I, I do not recall the exact uh, numerical values of GA1 and GA1. Okay, so I just wrote it in the the solution that I find okay sorry for that but seems correct so you can apply this relation to find G1 and G GB1 okay so I guess from this you can find the net work interaction as well right and or at least try to obtain the expression for work net work net work interaction because see if you apply the first law of thermodynamics in this case for compartment A because you need to find the temperature at compartment A only so that's the question we have so we have that del Q is equal to del W plus del w right mm. okay let me just check okay <laughs> enough time i'm just trying to uh, tell you the next part of the calculation okay so and temperature you need to keep it in Kelvin okay that's again an important catch so any calculation that you are going to do say if you see in this case P is not in terms of difference right it is an a single value it's at an absolute value so in this case and I would say an ideal practice for while we are discussing thermodynamics is to keep the temperature at the absolute scale for most of the times okay so 
because say if you are going to find the net change in the energy so it is actually net change in temperature so net change in temperature would be same even if you keep it in uh, kelvin or degree celsius that's fine but if you are saying that what is the internal energy of the system at a particular temperature in that case the temperature should be in the absolute scale that is in the kelvin scale okay so i think that's the reason for this variation in the value of uh, volume but let me just verify it but nevertheless what will happen is that for compartment a this is zero right so you would have du as minus delta w now we can write du as what m c v dt and delta w will again be uh, integral of p d v right so So now, now you can use this relationship to find the re relation between the change in volume and the temperature of the system to find the net change net, to find the net the final temperature of compartment A. Okay. I'm sorry that I'm not, not able to show, but I'm just telling you. You can try it in the exam. Okay. So you can substitute the value of P from this relation. P is equal to 288.683, so you will get P is P s uh, 288.683 divided by V. So you can substitute the value of P here and then evaluate the integral. I'm sorry, I should have put the integral sign here. So it should be on this side also. So from this equation, you can get the value of from that P. Substitute uh, eliminate P from this relation. So you can get P S P S minus six P S P V V by V. Right. Now you can modify this equation accordingly, whatever uh, whatever you have given. So and you can do it for um, V V by P. So this is minus two H P S. V and this is VV by V. I hope I'm not wrong. Then now after now, now you can do the integral to find the relationship between P and V. Okay. So this is the step. So let us wait. Okay, it seems time's running out. So okay, let us just look at the solution once so that you can just verify okay so this is actually the step i wanted you to follow uh, this is just to compare the answer okay so this is bigger than this right okay so <coughs> we have that the initial state of the system is mass is 0 0.2 kg for compartment a pa1 1 cubic per pascal pa1 is 313 kelvin okay similarly mass at compartment b is 1 kg <coughs> PB1 is equal to PA1 that is 1 cubic per pascal and PB1 is equal to PA1 that is 313 Kelvin. Okay, it's already given in the question. The final pressure of the system is 300 kilo pascal where PB has a relation of PV, relation of volume has a relation of PV is equal to 288.683 and PV is 733 joule per kg per volume. So the initial volumes can be found out using this relationship. PA1 is 288.68 into 313 by 15,000. Uh, 1 lakh 50,000, which is basically, it seems 15, uh, 1 is 15 kilopascal, so you need to convert it into pascal, because they mentioned that in this relation, pressure is in pascal, right? So what you do that is that VA1 has 0 0.120476 meter cube, and VV1 has 0 0.60238 meter cube. Let me check the answers. Yeah, exactly. So thanks, Anil. Uh, sorry, um, volumes were correct. And I think the only mistake uh, Sanjay Kumar might have done was that he might have not changed either the vol the temperatures into the Kelvin scale or, or either the volume into kilopascal into pascal. Okay, so 
that just might have been the difference. Otherwise, seems correct. And I think it's more towards the temperature part, the temperature part, and and not the magnetic collision. But this is a possible misstatement. Otherwise, it's correct. Okay. So uh, let me proceed. And so compartment A, as I mentioned, D delta Q is zero because of the complete insulation, right? Because in the diagram, if I go back, I saw that you saw that it is insulated from this side, this side, this side, as well as from this side because this piston is well insulated, right? So it is insulated from all sides, so there is no heat interaction. But the heat applied to compartment B has an implication in compartment A because it tries to compress the air in compartment, sorry, air in compartment A, which results in an increase in the pressure in the compartment A, okay? So we will have BU is equal to minus delta W from the first law of thermodynamics. Right, so we can write B U as N C V into D P is equal to de minus delta W, which is equal to minus P B U. Now P B is equal to two eighty eight point six eight P, or P is equal to M into two eighty eight point six eight P by D. Right, because I mean, if since this is in uh, specific volume, we need to convert it into tot uh, total volume, <coughs> so that we can equate it with this. Side. Otherwise, we can also keep it in specific volume and multiply an additional mass. To this side as well, but just to simplify it, we are doing it uh, in this manner. Okay. So once you use equation one and two, you can write and eliminate pressure. Right. Basically, write this in terms of P here. So you will get M C V into D P is equal to minus M into two eighty eight point six eight P D V by D. Okay. Now we can write D V by D is equal to minus C V by two eighty eight point six eight into D P by T. Okay. So is it clear up till this step? If there's any doubt, you can just ask, point out to the equation. Like this equation is not clear. Uh, this part is not clear. I can repeat it. Okay. I hope it is uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if we integrate this equation, we'll get that. I'm sorry. The natural log of V2 by V1 is equal to minus 2.251 into natural log of P2 by P1. So we get that V2 by V1 is equal to P2 by P1 by P2 to the power uh, okay, sorry, I think sorry, it's Q, sorry, okay, sorry, okay, P1 by P2 to the power 2.5399, okay, V2 by V1 is equal to P1 by P2 to the power 2.5399. Now the thing is, both V2, both V2 and P2 are unknown in our case, right? So we cannot use this equation in this in this form to find the value of P2. So what we can do is now we can represent now V2 in terms of temperature. How? <coughs> because from the ideal gas law, we know that P1 V1 by P1 is equal to P2 V2 by P2, right? So once you once you use this uh, law, you will get that V2 by V1 is equal to P1 into P2 by P2 by uh, into P1, okay? Just the modification of the ideal gas law, okay? So from that, you can write, uh, I can just write the intermediate step as well. So it would be P1, P2 into P2 by P1 equal to P1 by P2 to the power 2.5391 or P1 by P2 equal to P1 by P2 to the power 2.5391. This term goes here, so just multiply, right? So it will be plus one, and you will get just you will get p1 by p2 is equal to p1 by p2 to the power 2.5391. So once you substitute the value of p1 and p2, p1 is 1 to 2 kilopascal, p2 is 3 hundred kilopascal, right? 
one is not integer of pascal. So once we substitute the value of p1, p2, and p1, we will get that p2 is equal to 3a2.10 on Kelvin or 3a2. So temperature component A means 3a2.10 on Kelvin. So is it clear till now? So that was the uh, final F solution. Keep the same role in photography also because here you need. Okay, so uh, let me just. Okay, see the thing is uh, on Saturday it is a different uh, tutor who, who takes the session. So I understand the Zoom has uh, uh, undergoing some issues currently. So let me just inform this to the MPPL group so that they can mention this to the other tutor as well. Okay, so mine will remain Google Meet. We will discuss it every Tuesday, but the other tutor since he uses Zoom, there might be some issues. Yeah, I will tell the MPPL team. Okay, thank you for the uh, query, and I hope I am able to help out in my own way. Okay, so thank you then. So I guess this that's all for today's session. Uh, let's uh, meet uh, next week. Okay, thank you so much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.